And without any further ado, let me welcome New York State Assemblyman Chris Tague. Uh, Assemblyman, how are you today? How are you doing? I am great, Andrew, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, you're a great friend, a great American, and it's a true honor uh, to be on here today with you, my friend. Well, the honor's mine. Thank you very much for taking the time. And thank you very much for all the New Yorkers that have expressed their concerns with this, for actually putting your time, your effort into this. You're a, a tremendous public servant. As we like to say, and we'll get into maybe a little bit of this, America's assemblyman over here, you know, so thank you for thank everything you, you do. Um, well, look, I, I dug through this regulation that uh, the governor proposed and uh, as did the uh, commissioner of the Department of Health. And I want to read one particular section to you and get your reaction. This is on page 18. It's it's section I for those of you that are looking for this. And this codifies in regulation the requirement that local health departments send reports uh, the department during an outbreak. Uh, that's a grammatical error that I actually read. You could read for yourself in the report there. That's why I stuttered there. Um, but this new section 2.13 added to clarify isolation and quarantine procedures. One clarifies that the State Department of Health has the authority to issue <laughs> isolation and quarantine orders, as do local departments of health. Two, clarifies locations where isolation and quarantine may be appropriate. Three, sets forth requirements for the con content of isolation and quarantine orders. Four, it specifies other procedures that apply when a person is isolated or quarantined. And five, it explicitly states that the violation of an order constitutes ground for civil and or criminal penalty, criminal penalties. Assemblyman, what's your reaction to that? Shocked, disappointed, angry, disgusted. You would expect something like this uh, in a third world country that we have a dictator, not in the free states of America. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we brought the lawsuit, uh, impending on people's constitutional rights. And this isn't a Republican or Democratic issue, Andrew. This is an issue about we, the people, and the government having too far overreach and too much power. Uh, you know, it just, it, it amazes me. There's a little bit of history behind this. This was actually a legislative bill that was introduced by Assemblyman Nick Perry in 2015. Now, he could not get a co-sponsor in the Assembly, even the leftist of left men members of the Democratic majority in the New York State Assembly would not sign on to this bill. It was so bad that they couldn't even get anybody in the New York State Senate on the Democratic side to take the bill. Governor Cuomo at the time inserted this as public health law. Uh, so, you know, we were getting all kinds of calls from constituents uh, and we said, you know what, enough is enough. Once Governor Cuomo had inserted this in as public health law, we said we have to take action. And I assume, and we'll get through this, that's probably where the separation of powers comes in, that the original judge ended up saying that this really was uh, a violation of the separation of powers, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so another thing I wanted to talk about was originally when this was challenged, when you guys ended up taking this to the court, the judge who originally heard and ruled against the state, Judge Ronald Plotz, uh, said that this is this not only violated the sep separation of powers in the executive branch creating this rule, but it also lacked any due process protections. What would this mean for New Yorkers' constitutional rights if these rules were implemented? That's the whole problem. What constitutional rights? <laughs> This quarantine regulation obliterates your rights. Uh, you literally have no rights under this regulation. You have no right to do notice before they lock you up or lock you down. You have no right to a hearing, no right to confront your accusers in a court of law, no right to an attorney until after you've been locked up, no right to an impartial judge to decide your fate, no right to try to negotiate your way out of the quarantine. Uh, the Department of Health can, with force, and this is the big part, with force of police or law enforcement, remove you from your home and put you in a quarantine facility of their choosing. 
for however long they want with no process by which you can be freed. And here's the big one. And with no proof that you are actually sick. Wow. My goodness. So with force of police and law enforcement, just play that out a little bit more for me, if you would, because I think that that um, that language is probably shocking to some people, myself included. Um, but considering what uh, the executive branch in Albany, what the governors, both governors, Cuomo and now Hochul did uh, it, it, under the guise of, you know, health emergency orders, uh, as I said in my monologue earlier, uh, you don't think they would do this? Just ask those New Yorkers that don't have a job because they didn't get the shot right now. That That's exactly right. And this is the way I look at it. And I think of you and your young family and my family, my kids are a little bit older. But could you imagine getting the phone call from your wife that the state police or the New York City Police Department at your house and they're dragging your daughter and your wife out and taking them to a quarantine facility? I mean, come on, this is America. What what have we become? I mean, this is just absolutely disgusting. And why government would want this type of overreach and power over the we the people, I don't understand it. Yeah, I, I it's it's mind boggling. Sadly, I'm not surprised out of this executive branch in Albany, but it's still I guess it still surprises me. So so I heard your attorney, uh, last name is Cox, uh, who, uh, what, what's her name, her full name? Bobby, wanna... Ann, Bobby Ann Cox. She's a phenomenal attorney, Andrew, a phenomenal attorney. And, you know, she's been doing this case pro bono for almost two years wow. on her own dime. Just an incredible patriot, cares about this country and cares, cares about the people. Yeah. So I've heard your attorney, attorney clarify this regulation. I'm going to quote her saying there is no time limit so they can lock you up or lock you down for days, weeks. There is no location restrictions. They can put you in any facility they want. They can either lock you down in their house or they can remove you from your house with, as you mentioned before, force of police and put you in a facility detention center that they choose you would have to say, uh, and that's what you would have to say. So uh, the question that I have with all this, and you kind of highlighted it with the last thing that you said with police force, uh, they didn't highlight exactly what the process would be for even forget about going in, it seems like even getting out so they could hold somebody in perpetuity, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. And that's one of the big problems with this. You know, and some are out there that are proponents of this trying to say, well, we're not putting anybody in, in quarantine camps or quarantine facilities. You can quarantine from home. No, home is not an option. This is where they come. They take you out of your home, put you in a, a, a place where they can guard you and keep track of every movement. This is this is the problem. This is what's unconstitutional. This is what's against your freedom as an American. And that's why we're fighting this. So uh, I want to move forward. You guys win the original case in state court in July of 2022. How soon after did you find out that Letitia James was going to file with the New York State Court of Appeals? Well, Letitia James actually filed a notice of appeal about a week after the original ruling. And that gave them about six months uh, to file their actual appeal. But they waited until after the November elections last year, and they didn't file their appeal until March of this year. And during that time, they asked the court in January for an additional two months to appeal this. So, you know, again, uh, politics at its best here in New York State. Yeah, Sam, I mean, you'll have to come on again at some point just to go through all the different things that they held until after the election in November of 2022. Because I could tell you, even in my neighborhood, they held a construction project specifically that uh, the candidate at the time, former Congressman Zeldin, was down there campaigning about. And, and I know that there are just so many that a lot of New Yorkers haven't heard about that they ended up uh, holding on to for politics. I'm going to ask you a little bit about politics as well. But uh, I want to get into something that I mentioned in the introduction here, uh, which I found appalling and kind of amazing. Uh, the Court of Appeals, which just overturned the case, they said 
uh, it was not because that they heard any of the facts and somehow disagreed with the original ruling uh, that this was a violation of the separation of powers or they disagreed maybe with the fact that this uh, did not actually uh, respect New Yorkers due process rights. But they threw it out because they claimed that you had a lack of standing. Now, explain to me how it's remotely possible that you or Senator Borello or uh, former Assemblyman, now Congressman Lawler, uh, elected in New York to preside over the lawmaking process, among other things. How do you not have standing when it involves new regulations that will have a direct effect potentially on you, but certainly on your constituents? Andrew, that is the great $64,000 question, <laughs> is why we don't have any standing. And I wish I could answer that. Uh, you know, they're saying it's not possible that sitting legislatures, uh, you know, we say that we don't lack standing to challenge this. Um, it's agency overreach uh, into the lawmaking realm. The governor and her Department of Health made a law, though they called it a regulation, which it's really a law, and they don't have the power to make laws. We all know that. Only the legislature does. They stole the lawmaking power of the legislature, and it's a clear violation of the separation of powers. Plus, Judge Plotz also struck down the regulation since it clearly and severely conflict with the 70-year-old quarantine law that's already in place. Agencies in New York State cannot make rules or regulations that conflict with our laws. You know, we don't live in a monarchy, and the executive branch cannot ignore laws and write rules that they like better. Unfortunately, that's not how the Constitution works. I, I don't I still just don't understand how on earth they could come to the you don't have standing. And if somehow they say, which is shocking to me, and, and this doesn't have any merit, that uh, elected currently elected members of the assembly and the state Senate don't have standing in bringing up uh, a suit that would directly affect their constituents. You guys also have uh, a group. I, I think it's called Uniting New York State. Of, I, I could be wrong about York. that. What's the yep. Yeah. Uniting, yeah uniting, New York New, State. uniting New York. Yep. Right. That also yep. brought it. So th there I, I, it, it makes zero sense whatsoever. And I, I can't believe that actually you would have judges that would that would throw you guys out for a lack of standing on this. Well, well, here's the whole thing, Andrew. The other thing is this case was not decided in the appellate division off the merits of the case. Mm -hmm. It was a cop out. Um, they knew that they knew if they did the right thing, they had to rule against the governor and Tish James, and they weren't uh, prepared to do that. And that's the shame. That's again, where we, the people lose and where we play politics. Uh, if they had made the right decision, they, they would have uh, followed right in the footsteps of uh, judge plots uh, and found this to be unconstitutional and we could have moved forward. Well, I'll put this part of the conversation to bed just in saying kind of to our listeners and everybody watching that uh, there is, in my opinion, nobody that has more standing to bring this than you, than Senator Borrello, than former former Assemblyman, now Congressman Lawler, certainly any citizen of New York who would be affected by this should. But on top of you guys being citizens of New York, you guys were elected, were duly elected members of the Assembly, of the State Senate, now a member of Congress, um, there's nobody that has more standing to actually bring this uh, than you guys in particular. So, so look, I, I want to now talk a little bit about uh, the next process, what the next step is, is the Court of Appeals has overturned this. What's the next step? And, and will you guys appeal this ruling further? Yes, we are going to appeal it. Uh, Bobby Ann Cox, our attorney, is already working on the appeal. As you know, the problem uh, is with the Court of Appeals is they have to agree to listen to your case. So that's going to be the first hurdle. So, but she's getting the troops uh, together, getting our information together. Like I said, she's been working on, on this case a little, I, I think a little, around, around two years pro bono. She's been doing it on her own, but we've had lots of great partners. Uh, Lee Zeldin uh, has spoken out on this uh, several times. Uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, 
of course, Congressman uh, Mike Lawler, he's, you know, part of the party. Uh, we have uh, some folks that also filed briefs uh, in the assembly, assembly uh, leader Will Barkley and uh, uh, Assemblyman Andy Goodell uh, from uh, Western New York, uh, who's a brilliant legal mind. So we've got partners. But, you know, I keep trying to tell people, we have supporters that are Democrats. This is not a Republican Democrat issue. This is a we the people constitutional issue. If you're a Democrat and you care about your freedom and you care about the Constitution, you should be on our team. We're, you know, that's what this is about. This is about protecting our freedoms protecting the American way and protecting the constitution of the state of New York and the constitution of the United States of America. Without that, we have nothing. I'm not going to add to that because I can't say anything better than that. That was, that's exactly right. Bingo. Just, if you guys want to hear my thoughts on it, just repeat everything that Assemblyman Take just said, because it's perfect. Um, so look, uh, this is the elephant in the room and something we kind of touched on before. But how much is politics at play in this case? You know, it's like I said at the beginning of this, you, you asked me what I thought. I'm disappointed. I'm angry. And I'm embarrassed to be a New Yorker with regards to the judiciary in New York State. I It is my feeling that the judiciary in New York State over the last few years has become nothing but another arm of the one rule party rule of the Democratic Party in New York State. And we've seen it in many other things. We have a good friend, the former president of the United States, that's going through the same thing in court in Manhattan right now, where we allow judges uh, sit on the bench that put politics ahead of the law and the American people. And it's really a shame. Uh, and I never thought uh, someone that cares deeply about the Constitution and American government, uh, I never thought I would say this, but I think that this decision uh, by the appellate division and the was just a cop out. Um, you know, it, it 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 kept them from really making a decision based on the merits of the case. And if this is how we're going to continue uh, to to you know to practice law throughout this country, we are in some serious trouble serious trouble. Man. Well, I'll tell you, before we get back and close out with regards to this in particular, I, I want to ask you about something else that it's going to be a, a very big focus of Albany uh, over the first quarter of next year, which is the redistricting process. W what can you tell me in terms of the latest with redistricting? I guess it's redistricting 3.0, 4.0. I, I don't know what it is at this point, but. Well, the good news is, is that the Assembly and the Senate have already, we've already placed our votes and we approved the maps that are in place now. Uh, you know, this is another example of the Democrats didn't get their way. So now we just take it to court and, you know, we'll find judges that will rule in our favor. That's, that's my feeling. I think that, you know, we brought a special master in, they drew lines, they had fair lines and listen, our people outwork Democrats in certain areas. Mark Molinaro, uh, Michael Lawler, the, these are guys, uh, Brandon Williams, these are guys that work their tail off and they won an election in districts that uh, Joe Biden had won in 2020. But they worked, they worked their tails off. And let me tell you this, they've done an excellent job in Washington for us since they've been there. And I hope to God we send them back. But you know, as far as the redistricting case goes, you know, I have to give a, a lot of props to John Faso and Ed Cox. These guys have been relentless. And uh, also uh, Lee Zeldin. These guys have been all through the state. They've been working their tail off to try to defend this. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, hopefully common sense and the rule of law will prevail. Uh, and I want to just be clear, when you say the Assembly and the State Senate ended up approving these maps, just so just in case you don't know, the Assembly and the State Senate, they actually are run by Democrats, super majorities in both the State Senate and the Assembly, and they voted on this. So it's not just a matter of Republicans voting on this. This was the bodies at large. Is that correct? That's correct. They, they It passed with a majority in both houses. So you needed at least, uh, you know, 
76 votes in our house, the Democrats hold 102 seats. And it was unanimous. These redistricting maps were unanimously passed in both houses. The current, the current redistricting maps. Well, my goodness. Well, look, I, I want to get back to there's certainly be plenty of time to talk about redistricting as we go forward here in the next couple of months. Um, but let me just ask in closing out about the isolation and quarantine rule that we talked about. How can New Yorkers uh, support the effort to appeal, whether it's financially or statements of support uh, for this fight? I think the best thing to do is to go to www.coxlawyers.com and you can click on the button. You can either get involved, get more information about the case, or if you're inclined uh, to donate money towards the cause, uh, we would ask you to. That would be great. They can also follow uh, Bobby Ann on her Twitter uh, feed, which is at attorney slash Cox. And, or you can go on my Twitter, or I guess they call it X now, Andrew. I got to be correct here. <laughs> go on X. <laughs> um, they can go to uh, Chris WC Tag, or they can go to se at Senator Borello or at Lawler for New York. We would love to have you uh, go on like and share our posts with regards um, to this case. But I think that most importantly, if you want to get involved, the best thing is to talk to Bobby Ann. Uh, she's, you know, she's been fighting this since day one. And by the way, when we talked about redistricting, she's actually working uh, on some of the redistricting stuff too. So, you know, and lastly, I think contact the governor's office and tell her not to reissue this horrendous regulation. I think that would be another big thing. I he heard some rumors that there are some bipartisan groups that are going to do um, some uh, uh, protesting at some Senate offices in the next couple of days. I, I haven't been privy to all that information, but I'm hearing bipartisan people that love and care about freedom and our constitution are actually going to do some protests at some New York state Senate offices in the next couple of days, just to let their, let their Senator know about their displeasure uh, about this law. And they would love for their Senator uh, to call the governor and tell her to, to knock it off. Well, Assemblyman, America's Assemblyman, Chris Tag, I want to thank you very much. And by the way, for, for those of you guys that haven't seen uh, Chris actually speak live, he's one of the best speakers you're ever going to see. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to share a stage many times. I always hated going after Assemblyman Tag because you could never just match his energy and enthusiasm. But uh, I just want to thank you very much for everything that you're doing for the state of New York and standing up for our constitutional rights, Assemblyman. A Merry Christmas season to you and your family. Same to you, Andrew. You are a great friend. Uh, God bless you and your wife and your little baby girl. Uh, so proud of you. And just so your listeners know, he's a pretty good speaker himself. <laughs> Don't let him fool you. He got a very bright future ahead of him. But God bless you and happy holidays to you and your family. And, and thank you for the opportunity to come on your show. It, uh, it made my day. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Assemblyman. And look, as the Assemblyman said, this is not a right or a left issue. This is a constitutional issue. Uh, so make sure that you are supporting uh, the lawyer Cox in this fight. We'll put up the website there. Uh, make sure you're out there. You're letting the governor know exactly how you feel about your constitutional rights being impeded on. So thank you very much again. And we'll see you next week. God bless America, Andrew. God bless America. God Thanks. bless America. And God bless our Constitution. Amen.